Hello everyone, thank you for being here attending my presentation. I'm Luca Susman and I'm a professor of structural integrity at the University of Sheffield in uh, the UK. The title of my presentation is Nominal Stresses to Assess Damage in Notched Additively Manufactured Steel Subjected to Constant and Variable Amplitude Multiaxial Fatigue Loading. The ultimate aim of this study is to investigate and assess the accuracy of the so-called modified Weller curve method in estimated lifetime of notched additively manufactured uh, metals when uh, these metallic materials are subjected to constant and variable amplitude multiaxial fatigue loading. In particular, uh, the modified Weller curve method will be applied along with uh, nominal uh, stresses. Uh, accordingly, in what follow, the approach will be introduced by assuming that the relevant stress states are determined by referring to the nominal net area of the uh, component being assessed. The modified Weller curve method is a, a conventional critical plane approach where the critical plane is defined as the plane experiencing the maximum shear uh, stress amplitude tau A. In other words, uh, according to this fatigue damage model, uh, micro cracks are uh, supposed to initiate on those material planes experiencing the maximum shear stress amplitude. But fatigue damage also depends on the amplitude of the stress perpendicular to the uh, critical plane. Uh, in fact, this stress uh, favors the uh, crack propagation process by uh, cyclically opening and closing uh, the micro cracks themselves. Uh, on the top of that, uh, fatigue damage is also influenced by the mean stress perpendicular to the uh, critical plane. In particular, this uh, mean uh, stress favors the uh, crack propagation process when it opens uh, the crack. Instead, a compressive uh, mean normal stress slows down the crack propagation process due to the friction between the uh, faces of of the micro cracks uh, themselves. Plus uh, here in this uh, term we have also a constant M which is called the mean stress sensitivity index. M is a, a material property which is determined by running appropriate experiments and it is this material property is seen to be different for different uh, materials. In particular, uh, this is due to the fact that different materials are characterized by a different sensitivity to the presence of non-zero mean stresses. So the stress components relative to the critical plane can then combine together via this stress ratio, rho effective, which contains two terms, rho m and rho a, where rho m is the ratio between the normal mean stress and the shear stress amplitude relative to the critical plane, whereas rho a is the ratio between the amplitude of the normal uh, stress and the shear stress relative to the critical plane. Uh, this ratio is uh, uh, sensitive to the presence of non-zero mean stresses as well as to the degree of uh, non-proportionality of the applied uh, load history. According to the modified Weller curve method, uh, fatigue damage is estimated via a modified Weller uh, diagram which plots the shear stress amplitude relative to the critical plane versus the number of cycles to fail. This diagram is called modified Weller diagram and it's a log-log uh, diagram. So now we can consider a simple cylindrical bar and initially we can assume that this cylindrical bar is subjected to uh, a, a uniaxial fully reversed uh, loading. By observing the uh, Morse uh, circles associated with uh, this uh, specific load case, it's easy to see that under uniaxial fully reversed loading, rho effective is invariably equal to unity. This means that uh, we can easily 
easily replot the uh, conventional uniaxial fatigue curve in uh, the modified Weller uh, diagram. And this curve is characterized by a uh, rho effective value invariably equal to 1. Now we can focus our attention on the torsional case and in particular we can assume that uh, the uh, cylindrical bar under uh, consideration is subjected to fully reversed torsion. According to uh, Morse uh, circles as shown here, under fully reversed uh, torsion, uh, rho effective is invariably equal to zero. So now we can report the torsional fatigue curve in the modified Weller diagram and this curve Curve, the blue one is then uh, associated with a rho effective value equal to zero. So basically via the modified Weller diagram what we can do is uh, plotting together uh, the fully reversed uniaxial fatigue the curve and the torsional fully reversed fatigue curve and this is done by uh, plotting uh, these two different experimental uh, uh, curves uh, in terms of uh, the shear stress amplitude to the relative to the critical plane. So in terms of a stress analysis, this representation is clearly consistent because all the experimental uh, data and results are uh, reported or post-processed according to the critical plane uh, approach where in this case the critical plane is the plane experiencing the maximum shear stress uh, amplitude. Here in this uh, schematization, as you can see, the blue curve, that is the torsional curve, is uh, plotted above the red curve. This is because uh, if we, uh, for instance, consider von Mises uh, criterion and we try to calculate uh, the relative position of the two knee points in this configuration, it's easy to see that uh, according to, for instance, von Mises criterion, the blue curve must be above the red curve. And actually this uh, trend is uh, fully confirmed by uh, the experimental evidence. So, having defined uh, the uh, modified Weller curve under fully reversed uniaxial fatigue loading, that is the red curve in this diagram, as well as the modified Weller curve under fully reversed torsional loading, that is the blue curve in this uh, graph, now we can form the hypothesis that uh, as rho effective changes, uh, different curves uh, can be plotted in the same schematization. However, clearly, in situations of practical interest, uh, what, what is available is certainly the uniaxial fully reverse fatigue curve, and uh, we can certainly determine experimentally also the torsional fatigue uh, curve. This means that all the other curves that uh, are needed in order to design a component against multiaxial fatigue loading according to this approach must be somehow estimated. Okay, we can say that in general terms, uh, any modified Weller curve is uh, defined via its endurance limit extrapolated at uh, a given number of cycles to fail, as well as via the negative inverse slow k tau. So if uh, the assumption is uh, formed that uh, the modified Weller curves in this schematization move downwards uh, in, in, as uh, rho effective increases, then we can say that uh, the relationship between the uh, endurance limit and rho effective is uh, a simple linear relationship. In a similar way, we can form the uh, assumption that uh, the relationship between uh, the negative inverse slope of the uh, modified Weller curves and rho effective is again given by a simple linear law. So if uh, uh, we use then a simple linear schematization to model the way the negative inverse slope and the um, endurance uh, limit vary as rho effective increases, uh, we can then use the uniaxial and torsional fully reversed curves to calibrate these uh, governing equations. And these basic equations represent the mathematical foundations on which the modified Weller curve method is based.
If a component is subjected to constant amplitude multiaxial fatigue loading, then uh, the equations we saw in the previous slides are uh, enough for the uh, fatigue lifetime to be estimated. In particular, consider a component and assume that the stress uh, tensor at the critical section is uh, uh, available non. So by post-processing this stress tensor, then we can calculate the stress components relative to the critical plane. And given the stress components relative to the critical plane, we can determine the associated uh, value for rho effective. But as soon as rho effective is known, from uh, the calibration equations we use to apply the modified Weller curve method, we can uh, estimate the knee point at the inverse slope uh, characterizing the curve uh, that is supposed to be used to design our component. So given this design uh, curve, and here the curve is plotted in a modified Weller uh, uh, diagram, then via the shear stress amplitude relative to the critical plane, we can directly estimate the number of cycles to failure. So as you can see, in terms of uh, design under constant amplitude uh, loading, what we do is uh, following the standard procedure which is uh, adopted to design uh, components when they are subjected uh, to uniaxial fatigue loading. But uh, in this case, the advantage is that we can apply the standard approach no matter the complexity of the applied load history. In order to extend the use of this approach to uh, uh, situations involving variable amplitude multiaxial fatigue loading, we need to take a further step and in particular we need to find a different way or a more effective way to define the orientation of the critical plane. Uh, in particular, we suggest to determine the orientation of the critical plane via uh, the direction, uh, here it's direction MV, experiencing the maximum variance of the resolved shear stress. In particular, direction MV is the direction associated with the maximum variance of shear stress tau MV, which is the shear stress resolved along uh, this uh, direction. Okay, so this approach uh, is uh, actually uh, very straightforward to be applied uh, from a computational point of view. So it's, uh, it's uh, in a way the formulation is complex, but uh, from a computational point of view, it's very straightforward and very effective. And by using this approach, it is very easy to determine the orientation of the critical plane, no matter the complexity of the load history being reanalyzed. And in particular, as soon as uh, the uh, orientation of the critical plane is known, we can easily uh, determine the stress component perpendicular to the critical plane, so sigma n, as well as uh, the uh, shear stress component resolved along direction mv. So the critical plane approach as uh, um, used by the modified Weller curve method is applied by considering tau mv, so the resolved shear stress, and sigma n, that is the normal stress perpendicular to the critical plane. The two relevant stress components uh, determined according to the strategy briefly reviewed in the previous slide can then be post-processed directly to calculate the uh, 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 equivalent mean value and the equivalent amplitude of the two uh, channels. This is done by using this very standard formula, so where basically overall the uh, normal mean stress is the average of the stress perpendicular to the critical plane, whereas the equivalent amplitude depends on the variance of the uh, uh, stress perpendicular to the critical plane. In a similar way, uh, the uh, equivalent shear stress amplitude relative to the critical plane can be calculated by the variance of the shear stress resolved along the direction of experiencing the maximum variance of the resolved shear stress itself.
So now we have all the stress components we need to calculate raw effective, but this time raw effective is calculated by post-processing the two master uh, stress signals calculated by considering a complex multi-axial variable amplitude load history. According to the definitions uh, reviewed in the previous slide, then we can perform the multi-axial fatigue assessment also under variable amplitude fatigue loading. In particular, the stress state at the critical point or at the critical pass action can be post-processed in order to define the orientation of uh, that direction experiencing the maximum variance of the resolved shear stress. Via direction MV, uh, we can then calculate the orientation of the critical plane. And as soon as the orientation of the critical plane is known, we can then define the two master channels, that is, the shear stress resolved along the direction uh, experiencing the maximum variance of the resolved shear stress itself, uh, but we can also define the uh, stress perpendicular to the critical plane. So, by post-processing the uh, shear stress relative to the critical plane according to the rainflow uh, counted method, we can determine the associated load spectrum. Please note that here we can apply the rainflow counting method directly because uh, the shear stress result along direction MV is a monodimensional stress quantity, so we can apply the rainflow counted method in a rigorous way. But uh, from, uh, at this point, from the um, uh, uh, equivalent uh, stress components uh, relative to the critical plane, and by using uh, the uh, governing equations, which are uh, uh, the, uh, the core of the modified Weller curve method, we can estimate via rho effective the position of the design uh, curve we use to estimate fatigue damage. So given the uh, design curve uh, and the associated uh, and the various uh, stress level characterizing the load history under investigation, we can calculate the damage associated with any uh, stress level being identified and from the total damage we can calculate the number of blocks to fail. Please note that here in this formula DCR uh, is the critical value of the damage sum and in general terms uh, this uh, uh, value is uh, seen to be different for different materials and for a given material it can change uh, as the complexity of the load history varies as well as as the characteristics, the geometry of the component uh, changes. However, if we uh, apply uh, the theory as developed by uh, Palmgren and Miner, we can certainly calculate the number of blocks to failure by taking the critical value of the damage sum invariably equal to unity. Stated at the very beginning of this presentation, uh, the ultimate goal here is to apply our approach in terms of nominal net stresses. So what we need to do is using the basic knowledge we have in order to correct the uh, plain uh, fatigue curves, that is the uniaxial fatigue curve and the torsional fatigue curve, to take into account the detrimental effect of the notch being designed. And in particular, we can uh, correct these two calibration cores via the fatigue strength reduction factor under uniaxial loading KF as well as via the fatigue strength reduction factor under torsional loading. These are the standard definitions for KF and KFT and they can be found in any textbook. Plus, when we want to design a notched component in terms of nominal net, uh, in terms of nominal net stresses, certainly what we need to do is uh, performing the stress analysis by referring to the nominal net area. Having uh, defined the basic concepts on which uh, the modified Weller curve method is based, the next step is 
assessing its accuracy in performing the multi-axial fatigue assessment of notched 3D printed metals. To the end, we considered a, a, a very large data set taken from the literature, and here you can find the um, uh, uh, reference. And uh, these uh, uh, specimens uh, were uh, manufactured uh, using the DMLS uh, technology. The material was uh, AISI uh, 316L. Uh, the bar uh, being 3D printed were then heat treated. And uh, finally, they were uh, manufactured using a conventional lathe in order to obtain the three geometries shown here. So we are talking about conventional uh, notched cylindrical bars. We explored uh, three different uh, notches, resulting in three different values for the stress uh, concentration factor. In particular, um, the, sharp, uh, the sharply notched uh, bars were characterized by a, a stress concentration factor under tension equal to 7.2, whereas the corresponding stress concentration factor under torsion was 3.1. The other uh, two geometries, that is the intermediate notch and the blunt notch, had uh, axial stress concentration factor equal to 1.8 and 1.4 respectively, uh, whereas the torsional uh, stress concentration factor were equal to 1.3 for the intermediate notch and 1.1 for the blunt notch. The specimens manufactured uh, according to what uh, was reported in the previous slide were then tested under uh, uh, combined axial and torsion. In particular, we considered uh, both in-phase and uh, 90 degree out-of-phase situations. And for these two uh, different uh, phase angles, uh, we uh, ran our test both under fully reversed loading and under a loader ratio equal to zero. Plus, uh, we ran not only constant amplitude tests, but uh, we also ran variable amplitude tests. And here you can see the load spectrum that was adopted for this experimental investigation. In particular, the load, uh, the block uh, contained 1000 cycles and the distribution of the cycle was obtained by considering a conventional uh, ray light distribution. So the uh, uh, uniaxial and torsional fatigue curves that were needed to calibrate the modified Weller curve method for any uh, uh, notch geometry being considered were determined from the plane fatigue curves by estimating Kf and Kft. Kf and Kft were uh, calculated by using this uh, standard formulas uh, where Kt and Ktt are the stress concentration factors and Q instead is the uh, notch sensitivity factor. So uh, for uh, this particular IM steel, Q was seen to be equal to 0.082 and Q was calculated by considering the uh, endurance limit of the uniaxial fatigue curve generated by testing the sharply we notched specimens, that is, those specimens having a uniaxial uh, KT value equal to 7.2. Here in this slide, you can see the overall accuracy that was obtained by applying our uh, uh, approach to post-process the uh, fatigue results being considered in this investigation. In particular, these uh, graphs plot the experimental number of cycles to failure, NF, versus the estimated number of cycles to failure. Here, as you can see, uh, uh, the majority of the estimates uh, fall, uh, falls within the uh, uniaxial scatterband associated with the fully reversed curve that was used to estimate uh, factor Q. So, uh, this uh, certainly is a very uh, encouraging result and uh, certainly the accuracy under constant amplitude loading is satisfactory. Similar way, here you can see the estimates we obtain by post-processing the results are generated under uh, variable amplitude multi-axial fatigue loading. 
again the estimates are overall satisfactory even if uh, you know there are some problem associated with the fact that uh, really the critical value of the damage sum is uh, seen to vary as the sharpness of the notch changes uh, in contrast here all the estimates were obtained by setting the critical value of the damage sum invariably equal to one as recommended by palmagren and mine so actually it has to be said that uh, the, the fact that uh, the critical value of the damage sum changes uh, with uh, the uh, sharpness of the notch is not surprising at all because this is uh, something very common also when it comes to conventional metallic materials. Uh, but uh, despite of these uh, problems, which are uh, problems we have also when dealing with uh, conventional metallic materials, clearly uh, these uh, graphs show that our approach can be used to uh, design notched uh, uh, 3D printed metals against uh, variable amplitude multi-axial fatigue loading by always reaching an acceptable level of accuracy. In conclusion, we can then say that uh, uh, the modified Weller curve method applied uh, in terms of nominal uh, stress quantities is uh, successful in estimating fatigue uh, damage in notched uh, 3D printed components of AESI 316L with this uh, holding true no, not only under constant but also under variable amplitude multi axial fatigue loading. So these results uh, tell us that uh, certainly we can uh, use this approach in situations of practical interest to design uh, real components against fatigue. Thank you very much for your attention.